This Week in Startups is brought to you by Audible.com, a leading provider of spoken audio information and entertainment. Listen to audiobooks whenever and wherever you want. Visit audible.com slash twist for your free audiobook. iTunes Review of the Week is from Mike. Big thank you for putting out the most unbelievable content for tech startups, entrepreneurs, and founders. Leave a review on iTunes and get featured on the show. Hey, everybody. Welcome to This Week in Startups, the show where we talk about technology trends uh, and just how the world's changing uh, through entrepreneurship and technology and even investing in entrepreneurs who build technology. A big part of what I like to do is meet authors who are studying different aspects of our life and thinking about these issues. Now, what are some of the big issues of our time? Garbage, traffic. These are big deals, right? We have a lot of startups who are attacking these spaces, sustainability, and also, obviously, transportation has become the high order bit right now. We had no idea uh, that it would be um, such a big topic, uh, but my guest today, Edward Humes, he, he knew it would be a big topic. What attracted you to writing the book, Door to Door, The Magnificent, Maddening, Mysterious World, of transportation, I got curious, you yeah. know, and uh, actually, it started with my 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 rotten cat, you know, we, we, who's a diabetic, it turned out, and uh-huh. we had to order special food for him, mm-hmm. and I just found it online. You couldn't get it anywhere nearby, and I you had a diabetic I, cat, I, I, a stinker of a cat too, but yeah. I was in charge of uh, dealing with it, so uh, uh, I ordered this food from Amazon.com because if you can't find it around, that's the place yeah, you go, right? Sure. And I just got the free shipping and said, it'll get here when it gets here. Well, eight hours after I clicked on it, this was at the sort of onset of the over of a same day delivery, you know, right. the holy grail of online retail, right? And I wasn't really thinking about it. It was there like six hours, eight hours after I clicked on it. Just stuff from across the country. Yeah. Expensive. This is in uh, Southern California. I said, how, how, do, how the heck does this happen? Yeah, in Southern California where, uh, uh, where I live. It was a uh, number of years ago. It's about two and a half years ago. Two and a half years ago. So this ago. stuff shows up. I said, how can that possibly be? I mean, in yeah. any previous age, it would have seemed like witchcraft to make this happen. Uh, I, I couldn't have fetched it anywhere yeah. in one day. Uh, and it sort of made me curious about what it takes as we uh, as this type of of purchasing, this have-it-now economy is right. emerging. Uh, what, is, what does it take to keep that moving, to keep ourselves moving, keep our mm. stuff coming to our door to support a right. family. I thought, if, if I could look at the transportation embedded in my daily existence, it might tell us something about the, the, the entire challenge before us. Are, are we getting better and better at it? Or you know, are we about to fly off the rails because we're, we're becoming increasingly sustainable in, in how we're supplying ourselves? And Amazon has been the big driver of this in, in recent history, or is this building on the backs of like the FedEx, UPS infrastructure? How, who, who's the driver of this? It seems to me Amazon has changed everything with this Amazon Prime it, and people having the has. expectation of getting it in two But that's days not the free. driver. They okay. are sort of the consequence <clears throat> of things that happened 30, 40 years ago. And the real, the real driver, in my opinion, is, is the shipping container, the most lowest tech thing you can think of, a big steel box, but it right. changed the world. I mean, you, all of a sudden, this incredibly labor-intensive, error-filled, pilferage plagued system of shipping goods around the world. Everything goes in a sealed box. You can load it 10 times faster than an old, old school cargo ship Mm. literally made global trade cost effective in a way that it had never been before. Because they came up with a standard that fit two major criteria. One, it was secure. So it'd be trustworthy. You're not going to lose money. People are not going to be able to open them. Right. And number two, you can get them on and off of ships and on and off of rail cars quickly. Quickly and with a fraction of the labor. Ah. A guy in a crane, a guy in a truck driving the the, the container up, bingo, you're done. Mm. And and um, you attach a little tracker on it, and all of a sudden you can have an enormous port filled with these things, and you can find any one that you want at any time. Huh. And suddenly you have a system that, altered a method of shipping that really hadn't changed significantly since the ancient Greeks <laughs> were, were flying the Mediterranean. The what was the driver the 70s of this? And 80s, yeah. yeah. Who, who drove the shipping container? Was there an indiv- individual who had this idea? Yeah. yeah. Well, it, it was it China? In, no, actually it was uh, what was then and would later become um, 
the largest uh, shipping company in America. Of course, we have no shipping companies now. We've, right. we've given that line of business to others. Um, maybe a lot of people are happy about that since they're starting to go get bankrupt. But that it was the Sealand um, mm-hmm. shipping company that first popularized these containers. And they had a ship that could fit 200 of them on. And right. now, of course, you can fit... Uh, you know, as many as uh, eight or 9,000 shipping containers on these big, um, uh, and sometimes now the latest ones even more on these big uh, container vessels. These container vessels can hold 9,000 containers. You can, you can unload in the space of a half an hour and enough goods from one of these ships, just a half an hour. In so, half an hour, okay. That's not the whole ship, that's just right. the portion ship. Uh, enough containers to stock five Target stores. Wow. Five empty Target stores. Yeah. So just, these are sh- these ships. All right. Here's another thing. We are uh, not too far from the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach right now. Yeah. Biggest ports in North America. Long Beach is gigantic. Yeah, and Los Angeles is even bigger. But they, mm. are, for all intents and purposes, they might as well be one port. Although mm. they have separate separate leadership and they yeah. are separate. Thirty to forty percent of the nation's uh, uh, consumer goods come through these ports on any given day, and uh, at any given day, there's a hundred of these enormous double football field size ships either docked there or waiting to dock in long lines. You can see them miles down the coast waiting. And those hundred ships, when they're out at sea have, this is the, one of the hidden price tags of our door to door world. Those hundred ships have the same and or greater smog and particulate emissions uh, of all the cars in the world. Wow. All the cars in the world. So these shipping containers are polluting the environment at a level of all the cars in the world simply so we can get our iPhones and our whatever clothes from China. Our bikes, you know, 98% of our bicycles come in through that port. Right. Uh, most of our clothes, uh, most of our furniture. I mean, on, you, you name a thing in your house, it has arrived by container ship. About 90% of the world's goods come to us that way. Now- um, this has led to uh, the emergence of a middle class in China and the, oh, yeah. uh, this, in a way, the ability to ship this much stuff so efficiently, it's had massive global ramifications. I mean, you have a middle class emerging in China. You have also politically, China is now moving to, I don't know if it's a socialist uh, capitalist economy. I don't. It's not a democracy, but it's certainly not as authoritarian and closed as it once was. Is shipping responsible for that, or you know? Well, you know, the the, the two edged sort of global trade is getting a big black eye in the current election. Yeah. Discussions, but look at the national security implications of having such a close economic relationship with China, which right. we never had before. The the idea of real conflict between us now is so remote. Right. Uh, that that uh, uh, that it really isn't likely to happen in anything resembling the current political environment. And that's not because of our uh, military might. It's because of the economic relationship that was was uh, fostered in part by the by the containerization of our, our goods. Uh, it was an unintended and arguably beneficial consequence, but there's all kinds of other things that you have to look at to uh, to judge whether we've made a better world uh, now compared to then, because of course we've lost a lot of jobs. The, uh, the, the blue collar workforce of America doesn't have the sort of path to the middle class it did before this containerization. Right. So again, it's... It, but the global workforce is starting to balance out. Elon Musk is opening the Gigafactory uh, out uh, past Reno, in, I guess, Nevada, I went to visit it, and he explicitly said in his sort of keynote and his address to the crowd there, which was filled with all the sort of Tesla's biggest super fans, people who had bought cars previously or multiple cars, um, that it didn't make sense to um, ship stuff to China, then ship it back, or ship stuff from China here, that we had to make everything here, and that the one of the big problems was that people were manufacturing parts of cars all over the world which had one level of efficiency, but then because they had to all be transported and then reassembled, right. and then the cars had to be shipped back to China or wherever they were going to be sold, this made no sense. And so he was going to centralize the battery manufacturer, the car manufacturing, and these actually having raw materials coming into one side of the factory and the car coming out the other. And he's going to build a similar factory in Asia, or maybe one in Europe, so that the cars then don't have to be reshipped. Is that the future? Are people going to start rethinking this and say, hey, maybe this doesn't make sense because the labor markets are not providing that much of an advantage? 
Uh, short answer, yeah. And uh, actually, it made me think of something Steve Jobs said not too long before he died, which was that you know, in terms of computer chips and and the equipment you need to make an iPhone, uh, that those jobs weren't coming back to the U.S. And we don't really want them back because if you look at the price of an iPhone, for instance, yeah. um, the labor cost is like minuscule. Right. <laughs> part of it. So, in other words, if we get those jobs back, they're not high-paying jobs. Right. Uh, or the economic model fails. So some things though, because of the kind of automation that, um, the gigafactory employs, yeah. um, uh, technology that's rapidly developing like 3d printing, mm -hmm. it's, it, it, the economics of manufacturing, uh, regionally or locally are getting better and, and better. So yeah, a lot of the, a lot of opportunities are going to come back in terms of making things here, but there may not be that great a number of jobs coming with them because much of this technology of manufacturing is automated. Mm. So it doesn't have the kind of seventies or eighties era factory worker uh, numbers that uh, we, we lost back then. So when you were getting your cat food back to the cat food for your <laughs> diabetic cat, um, it got there in eight hours from across the country. It came in the same I don't day. Know. Well, you, you know, don't I, actually know. I, I, I puzzled about this because it's not a high demand product. Mm -hmm. It originates in the Midwest um, uh, but Amazon has gotten really good at positioning mm. its goods in different distribution centers. Um, so uh, I, I didn't get a good answer for that, but yeah. what I, what I suspect is that they have a strategic posting of goods, even low volume goods uh, around the country so they can make that happen. Uh, one of the companies I looked at was Domino's. Everybody thinks Domino's is a pizza company, right? right. It's not. It's a, it's a transportation company. And there's a great, there's this great place. So if you go to Ontario, California. Yeah, I know Ontario. Ontario Major is, cargo airport there. Yeah, it's um, 50 miles east of Los Angeles, I think, right? Ontario? Yeah, approximately. About a and mile it's, uh, in, an yeah. uh, hour in. Just over the county line into it. You know how I know Rivers. that? They used to in JetBlue was the first airline they were a discount. I was broke. And I used to come out here to see my now wife. And I would fly into Ontario because I was so broke that they weren't giving flights away there. It was 150 bucks to fly from New York or something. And yep. you could rent the car there for nothing. So I had more time than money. I was like, oh. drive in from Ontario. And I would drive in for Ontario. But the hour in a cheap car that would cost half as much to rent a car out there. And the price was one third for the ticket. Like giving up an extra half hour made sense. Well, that, but that's a cargo airline. That air. area out there around that airport and, and for miles in every direction is <clears> now <throat> the logistics center for American capitalism, basically. This is where... Ontario. Yes, because look, think, of, think of Los Angeles. You have the biggest ports and all these goods coming in, but sure. they have to make it to... They have to get to a place where they can move on to their next destination. And right. Los Angeles is too dense. The traffic is too bad. So this area around Ontario, the Inland Empire, it's yes. now called... What an it empire is the it land is. of distribution centers and warehouses, everything from Skechers to, well, Domino's has yeah. one, they're one of their major distribution centers. And the airport is U, one of UPS's biggest operations ah. there as well. So every day those UPS jets come in, there's a secure area, 24 hour a day guards, as well as video surveillance. And there's these unmarked pallets that are of goods that are worth more than their weight in gold. There's your next iPhone coming into the country. And those ah. come in every day. And then you have Domino's down the road. Every morning they're making 100,000 bowl, bowls of dough fresh and packing into the trailers every what? day, along with all the other ingredients that you make pizza, out of, which they source from all over. And then they're shipping it to all their franchisees around Los from Angeles Ontario. Basin. From yeah, Ontario. From Ontario. That's where... So the dough is centralized in one location and then goes to all those little dollars. All those, the, and they have it down to... Uh, an amazing uh, system. They have these uh, very advanced trucks that are semi-automated. They have uh, collision avoidance systems on, on them, and they deliver pizza everywhere in the Los Angeles area every day, 100,000 a day or more. And it, it is a sight to behold. Uh, and that's why I say they're a transportation company. They're franchise owners. They're the pizza, co they're the pizza yeah. makers. These guys know how to transport the stuff to make pizza. And that's how... You know, that slice of pizza you think is being driven four miles from your Domino's. It's real mileage. If you add up all the ingredients that are shipped every day, we're talking about, you know, an 80,000 mile pizza before you're done. And this is affordable because centralization of the creation of 
the dough, whatever, the centralization save so much money or because oil is so cheap right now? Why it's Why a, does this make sense? It's affordable and, and containerization and global sourcing of like really inexpensive goods like socks is affordable because we externalize the costs. We're not actually paying the true cost. So you have, I mentioned the emissions of, of cargo vessels yeah. that haul most of our goods right, around, the, around the globe. Well, there's... There's also the um, carbon cost mm. that they emit. Now, if, if their cargo fleet was a country, it would yeah. be the fourth largest uh, greenhouse gas emitter in wow. the world. It, it emits more greenhouse gases than the fourth largest economy, Germany. Huh. So that tells you, you'll hear people uh, in, in um, product uh, manufacturing say, oh, the transportation emissions per item are minuscule. It's not the biggest part of the footprint. And that's factually true, but it kind of masks the fact that the way we get our stuff around, if you add it all up, is incredibly impactful on the environment. And it, that's all off the books because it all happens out in international waters. Ah. So nobody even counts it. Nobody counts it, it because doesn't count. it's an international It doesn't belong water. to anybody. <laughs> really? Yeah. <laughs> that's what a, a crazy loophole. Yes, it is a, it's, a, it's the ultimate loophole. And, and, and those horrible. kinds of hidden costs are, are tucked away into our entire transportation system. Our cars are an environmental disaster as well as the most wasteful investment we'll ever make you know this right. is, i mean 20 22 um, um, 22 hours of the day that car isn't doing anything but you're paying for it and maintaining it and insuring it constantly if you had a worker that only you know yeah <laughs> work worked uh two hours a day but right. you know got a full pay you you would go out of business pretty soon it's even less than that it's like 10 percent. it'd be like they worked 10% of an eight hour shift, which would be even less. A disaster. Well, the car is a disaster, but we take all those costs and sh put them off onto, you know, government supported uh, care and emergency rooms for lung disease and asthma. And we, and we ignore the fact that we're destroying our climate and, and, and polluting our air. And it's not reflected in what we pay at the pump. All right. Uh, when we get back from this quick break, I want to talk about the last mile and how, uh, Level four automation coming to self-driving cars, drones, and even these little robots that are now going to deliver from storefronts to, uh, you know, households that are look like little R2-D2s are going to uh, impact the door-to-door -door hey, economy. You want one of those, right? <laughs> I do. When we get back on This Week in Startups. Hey, everybody. I want to take a moment to thank Audible for partnering with us on This Week in Startups. I love Audible. You all know that. And they are the greatest platform for spoken word audio products. They have over 180,000 titles in every genre. And I buy about 20, 30 audio books a year. In fact, I just accelerated my Audible Platinum program uh, to start six months early because I've been consuming so many books while I commute up and down the peninsula here in San Francisco. Uh, but unlike other streaming services, you own your own books. That's critical. You want to own your own books. And... WhisperSync lets you sync them between your Audible account and your Kindle. You can read at any time in the car. You're always synced up. That's one of the things I love because I have two phones, an iPad, and a desktop where I listen to books. I've been listening to this great book, and it's my pick of the week. It's called A Guide to the Good Life, and it's by William Irvine. And uh, the subtitle is The Ancient Art of Stoic jaw Joy. And I read this because it goes through Stoicism, which is a school of philosophy. And you're like, hey, this is a startup thing here. Why would you be talking about Stoicism? Stoicism is a great thing to understand for when you're going through startup challenges. You can really figure out what it is that's triggering you and making you emotional and making you uh, incapacitated. And you can start to appreciate what's going on in your life. I absolutely think that this book, A Guide to the Good Life, um, the ancient art of stoic joy is going to be appreciated by founders and other people who are having maybe a little chaos in their life or emotional situations. It, you may not become a stoic, to be honest, but you may feel really good that you've been informed about the concept of stoicism. You know, some of the other audible books I've talked about, Creativity Inc. Uh, by Ed Catmull. He was just on the program and he was amazing. Um, Decide to Play Great Poker. I talked about that from Annie Duke. Um, Smarter, Faster, Better by Charles Duhigg. I mean, there's just The Man Who Knew Affinity was a great one. So many great books on Audible. Here's your special offer. Go to audible.com slash twist, audible.com slash T-W-I-S-T. This Week in Startups, right? Pretty clever. And you'll get a 30-day trial membership. You can download my book of the week for free. A Guide to the Good Life, 
The Ancient Art of Stoic Joy. Go ahead and get that right now. Audible.com slash twist, audible.com slash twist, and improve your mental state and your philosophy and grinding it out with startups. Stoicism, I find it very helpful for me. I really appreciate what I have. Uh, so go ahead and go to audible.com slash twist, audible.com slash twist. And I just want to say thank you to Audible. You guys know I've been a fan of the product forever. And it means a lot that literally every year Audible supports This Week in Startups. You don't have to. I know Audible is doing great. You don't need to be involved in these tiny little podcasts, but you do. You support us. I think it's a recognition that we put great content out in the world. And I know that you guys put a lot of effort over at Audible to putting great content on this. So all the folks over at Audible, thank you for just making the product better and better and better. The product's gotten great. I listened to that New York Times um, update. They give you a free New York Times update. It's great. And the channel feature is great. There's a lot of great content on Audible. Go ahead and get in there, audible.com slash twist. I could talk about them for days. It's such a great product. Okay, thanks, Audible. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to This Week in Startups. I'm your host, Jason Calacanis, and we do this podcast twice a week with entrepreneurs, investors, and thinkers in the uh, emerging space of innovation, technology, venture capital. And today, Edward Humes, or Ed Humes, as he likes to be called, is on the program. You can visit his website, which is really interesting, edwardhumes.com. He's also on the Twitter as Edward Humes. Um, and his latest book, Door to Door, The Magnificent, Maddening, Mysterious World of Transportation is available on Audible. Four and a half stars. You get some good reviews for the book. Congratulations on that. Not all my mom. Don't worry. Not all your mom, yes. And then uh, you also wrote Garbology, Our Dirty Love Affair with Trash. Uh, it's interesting. You have the consumption and the transportation on one side. You have the garbage going out on the other. It feels like your career is now like the arc of Wally. <laughs> if you've seen that film where consumerism... Um, really drives the earth to a very dark place. And there's also this other film. Have you ever seen the film? Um, oh, it's the Mike Judge film, uh, Idiocracy. Oh. You've seen it. Uh, part of it. Yeah. Part of it. Okay. So Idiocracy also has this, is basically came out before Wally, but it's the same exact theme, same which thing. is the superstores lead to massive consumption and the stupid people uh, destroy the planet Earth. Uh, spoiler alert. Everybody gets fat and stupid. Uh. Um, are you pessimistic about the future of humanity based upon what you've learned in terms of how we're absolutely decimating the environment and capitalism has run in terms of consumerism, that piece of it has run amok and we're, you know, doing things like, you know, replacing our phones every 18 to 24 months and the landfills are getting filled with toxic waste. Are you net net at the end of the day, optimistic about the future of humanity in this planet or are you pessimistic? <sighs> Knowing well, what you I, know I, that I, we don't. I have a little schizophrenic on that question, uh, but um, cautiously optimistic. Okay. I think, uh, for a lot of reasons. Uh, you know, on the one hand, this transportation, it's not really a system, it's a system of systems that we have in place, yeah. it is insane. Uh, and yet it's also our, maybe humanity's most towering achievement. I mean, you think that we can move these goods around the world reliably and trackably and, you know, land a case of cat food for my diabetic cat on, right. the, on the doorstep in hours where it would have taken weeks, you know, with our, in our yeah. lifetime. When it comes to medicine, it's when miraculous. it comes to, yeah, transporting blood or, you know, other things, you could see this as a massive impact on humanity in terms of our lifespan, but it also, the consumerism aspect of it, seems to be very Unsus challenging unsustainable Unsu and, and is it unsustainable have, and and we're making it worse if you look at same day delivery and yeah. how for instance the online retailers i don't want to single out amazon but they're the leading example so sure so let's say amazon i mean they they will sh it, it that amazon prime same uh, quick delivery model encourages people to order one thing at a time and uh. the little thing will come in a great big box filled with packing mm -hmm. it's another truck trip that used to be all these goods would be on a big truck go to a store and people will go and buy multiple things on a shopping trip that right. was the model now it's one thing all the way to the doorstep from right. the distribution center the number of traffic that uh, trips that are added to the equation when you do it that way is off the chart. So we're making our traffic worse. Are, are those uh, truck trips going up or do we just have these sort of permanent bus routes going around our neighborhoods where, yeah, they have to come to my block to give me my one iPhone case that I ordered, which I, I literally ordered an iPhone case because I needed it. And I got it, just like you said, with a ton of bubble wrap and a big box. 
or an iPhone right. case. I was like, can't put this in an envelope or like, I'm starting it, to feel guilty about it, but I guess they're coming up and down our block anyway. So does it feel like an extra trip or are we seeing net net the number of trips of Skyrim? The number of trips of Skyrim. I talked to UPS about the head, who the former head of the Los Angeles, Southern California region, which yeah. includes Hawaii and Arizona and a lot of other things. Uh, it's, it's their big money operation. Yeah. Noel Massey, amazing guy. And he was telling me how that every time the average route for a UPS driver goes up by one minute, they lose $1.2 million. Wow. So minutes are, they're obsessed with it. And the right. minutes are constantly going up for them, no matter what they do, uh, no matter how they try and get more and more sophisticated about route planning. Uh, the routes are getting more complex because it's no more business to business. It's all business to con consumer right. for them. That's their big growth area. So uh, yeah, from their perspective and the other delivery companies, it's, it's getting worse and right. harder to in urban areas to, to maintain uh, the, their business model. And so what's the end game here? Are we going to get to the point where as a society, we say, hey, same day delivery, ordering one thing at a time, we're gonna have to tax it and try to reduce people doing it? Are we gonna have to say, hey, put your stuff in multiple boxes or you know, are the consumers so trained now to get what they want instantly that this is, there's no going backwards. I, I think, and this is one of the areas where uh, trusting in technology to provide a better answer actually might be a good bet because I, and I, I think that 3D printing technology is going to change the world. It's going to make shipping virtual, basically. I mean, huh. you're going to have, not necessarily in your home, but something close by that fabricates a lot of the products that are now shipped long distances. And then, then you'll only need to move raw materials and that will be more efficient. It'll actually resemble the old way, except the product will be in its raw form and materialize. So, It'll be like beaming on Star Trek almost. Right. To, to get How together. far are we away from that actually happening? Because we had in our industry a huge brouhaha, a huge amount of investment in 3D printing six, seven years ago. MakerBot got bought. It never got passed, at least in the consumer home space, uh, trinket building, like everybody would make ornaments for their Christmas tree. Uh, it never became stuff that you actually needed. You still had to keep ordering from Amazon. It wasn't going to lower your number of Amazon orders or Walmart orders. Um, and it seems like in provisioning models in like, you know, if you're working at Tesla and you're making a car model or you're working at a, a company and you want to fabricate some prototypes. Yeah, it, it exists. Almost every one of those physical hardware companies has uh, 3D printing, how far are we away from it actually having some impact in terms of reducing the amount of stuff being shipped? There was awful high mm -hmm. expectations for it, um, and that excitement kind of abated when, you know, people, oh yeah, you can make a great little uh, toy soldier out of it, but, yeah. so, um, in our lifetimes, I think, we're yeah. going to see it reach a, reach a uh, watershed yeah. where uh, many it'll make sense to make many products that way and to customize them. I mean, the possibilities are, are obviously enormous. That's what generated the excitement um, in the first place. But 20, 30 years, maybe? That's that's what I'm hearing. Yeah. So, that, that's exciting. Um, uh, but in the meantime, what do we do, right? What do right. we do now? That's, uh, that's what people loved about that trash book because you can see there are things that a community or a household can do now to be less wasteful. Well, that applies to transportation too. There's a lot of things that we do that are so shockingly inefficient and you go i can go back to an earlier book i did called the force of nature it was about this um, consultant a river guide mm. who became walmart's green guru mm. and guided them into their initial efforts to try and be more sustainable they'll never be sustainable but more sustainable and one of the first things is the, the, these guys looked at was look at your trucks you have these guys parking your trucks and leaving the engines running to keep the air conditioning and the refrigerator going why don't you have auxiliary power units on that like sip gas rather than consume enormous amounts of diesel fuel and they said oh yeah we never thought of that and it was oh my one God. thing so they just put a tiny little generator on there yes that and it's gas and it's one percent or two percent of the exactly so uh, load all, of running a uh, semi and that was kind of no uh, brainer dumb, but one of the coolest things that he began doing was realizing the payoff of shrinking packaging mm. and making packages smaller because then you can fit more in a container, then you need fewer containers, then you need fewer ships, then you need right. fewer trucks, then you're using less gas, then you're cutting down less forests. And when you sell things in the volume of a Walmart and you start even reducing 
packaging 5% overall or making detergent bottles smaller, which they sort of forced the whole country to do, uh, you begin saving fantastic, some fantastic amounts of resources. Now, unfortunately, Walmart uses its sustainability and it's real, it's not greenwashing, to enable them to grow more. So it kind of cancels it, it out or they'll say, fortunately, we can do that. Yeah, uh, what's uh, interesting though, say, unfortunately. is you uh, see Amazon doing things like add-on product this, I think, is an incredible innovation. If something is very lightweight, they say, Put it in the box. Yeah. you can only do this if you're ordering something else that's heavier. We can't just send you a toothbrush. That's an add-on product. We're going to keep it over here on the side. We're not going to ship it to you for free with your Prime membership. Um, and then they seem to be um, doing also what they call, I think, simplified packaging. You can order stuff with simplified packaging, which I think means no packaging. So you can buy a cable without the box or stuff like that. Has this stuff started to make an impact or um, is it just it's, sort it's of- It's pretty nascent now, it's nascent, but yeah. it's good. I mean, anything that sort of improves the uh, uh, the uh, the wastefulness in what we do in transportation is our most wasteful part of the economy. Uh, uh, that's good. It's not the, it, it makes us less bad actually. It doesn't yeah. make us good, but it makes us less bad. And that's a start, um, but the, um, uh, you asked if I'm optimistic about yeah. uh, about the future. I think you said somewhat. Somewhat, uh, automation is is going to be key to making things like traffic better, to to to, to pushing uh, electric cars into mm. the forefront, um, because car ownership is really makes a lot less sense once you have automated vehicles. Uh, and think about this. Think about the average car. Right? It carries five people, five, six people, uh, room for six, eight suitcases. Yeah. Uh, but the normal use case for a car is one person in it going to work. That's, yeah. you know, one person in a briefcase on the floor. So we have totally, yeah. we need to have a, a Swiss army knife type vehicle because we want to have all use cases covered and we don't want to have a garage full or, you know, how, you know, a big lot full of cars for every driver. Um, but it makes our personal transportation so wasteful. Now, what if you had automated vehicles and a share model, a network model, like buying minutes, you buy drive time, yeah. you get exactly the car you need for what you're doing that yeah. day. For most people, it'll be one or, a one or two person vehicle going 30 miles or less. That's what right. most of our trips look like in America. Right. Perfect <clears throat> use case for electric vehicles for 90% of our trips. And automated. And automated. and automated. Automated makes it safe. It eliminates parking. It eliminates uh, 95% of our traffic crashes, which are 90% are caused by drunks, speeders, and distracted drivers. Right. So Those computers are don't tend to do that. So yes. They, yes. So, I mean, I met some computers who smoke and drink, but that's just really, yeah. like, it's on the edges. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so bad droids. <laughs> And, and not having to park, you know, there's estimates that in urban areas, something like 30% of the congestion is caused by people searching for parking. So wow, uh, all that goes away. This, the benefits plus the costs are lower. Yeah. I mean, right now, a lot of people are switching to not having cars uh, and just taking Uber or Lyft or a ride yeah. share. And Being it pays full, off. They call it full Uber in the business. I'm <laughs> it it pays investor. off up to a point. If you don't go more than maybe 10,000 miles in a year, it, it, it's a Is wash. Is that the breaking point, 10,000? Yeah. It's a wash? I did notice that because I have an expensive car. I have a Tesla, which... You know, I think operationally is something in the like eleven, twelve, thirteen hundred dollars a month if you owned it for whatever five, six, seven years. So that's a lot of Uber X rides when you start thinking about it. It is. It is. Uh, the now, charging is free, but the maintenance on it is still expensive. Now you right? got cars like the Chevy Bolt in the in the pipeline. That yeah, is a fraction of the cost of a of a Tesla. It's a third, right? It'd be thirty five. The same range. They're gonna have a hundred fifty mile range or They're something. They're talking over two hundred. Two hundred, yeah. So the prices are coming down. Tesla's got their Gen three. 400,000 pre-orders. Um, how soon before we start to see the impact of self-driving cars, do you think? Because you have Uber uh, running a test in, right. um, I think, Philly or St. Louis. I can't remember. Uh, I want to say it's in the Midwest. Somewhere. Yeah, it's Pittsburgh. At, no, Pittsburgh. It's Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh. So they're going to run that test. That's full autonomy, but with a driver as a backup. And they bought the company Auto, which is doing automated trucks, and they were doing real tests. Um, and then you have Tesla with their level two autonomy. I use that daily and it's pretty impressive on the highway when are we going to start seeing the majority of trips in the united states be level four autonomous no. in other words the, no tech, steering wheel. the technology is 99 percent there now huh. I, I i looked most closely at the google car and yeah. drove in it and um what 
their secret sauce is mapping technology. These right. cars, the automated cars that they're designing, and Ford is going with this model too, and some of the other manufacturers, it, it maps its environment with 360 degree, it's called LIDAR. Yeah. And it's like robotic vision. Yeah. And uh, that's different than the Tesla model that yeah. was recently in the news. Uh, and what it does is it makes such a detailed map of its environment that it knows exactly where it is. It's, it's way beyond GPS. Yeah. Uh, and it's it, 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 it's it, you can't sneak up on this car. Right. You can't. In fact, in fact, um, I saw it avoid colliding with a distracted pedestrian, a Google coder who was like literally typing on his laptop and jaywalking at the same time, and they walked right in front of the car that I was. And the car stopped. Around it. Oh yeah, it stopped. And yeah. that, I don't think a human avoids striking that. Uh, so that when car. do we regulatory? Um, consumer acceptance. When will we see level four autonomy doing the majority of trips in a city? Is that 10 years out, 20 years out? What do you, I, I asked a bunch of friends. I actually got a year average. Uh, so no. I'm curious what you think. No, politically uh, and culturally, we're not ready for it. I mean, yeah. I, I did a uh, consumer reports uh, asked me to do an essay about the, you know, what will driving look like in 80 years? And I said, oh, by then automation is going to be- 80 years, yeah. eight but zero. It, it had to do with the anniversary of their publication. Ah, so got it. The first 80 years, what about the next 80 years? And yeah. the- Well, that's a no brainer. So I said, oh, well, uh, yeah, uh, automation is going to be uh, an old story by for then. For sure, you'll been probably around be forever. flying cars. And, uh, but, and I sort of talked about what we could do now, like cars have cruise control now. Yep, adaptive Which is control. basically what, uh, it's an old idea of, called the speed governor. Back in the 20s, there was so, uh, such concern over what was then called motor killings, not accidents, motor killings, motor violence, yeah. uh, that they wanted to have a device, a mechanical device then in cars that would limit the speed mm. in urban areas. Uh, and there was such opposition to that and such fury and hate over, over even that idea that it died. Uh, well, now we have, every car's got a speed governor, but we let the drivers <laughs> set it. It's called yeah. cruise control. So right. we also have cars that know how fast they're going. Right. Phones Tell, I mean, put on yeah. ways or, or it yeah, gives it tells you, you you're 10 miles over, you're 20 we, miles over. In other words, we have in every car and on everybody's person, the technology to s prevent speeding. Right. Right? That's, we're talking about over a third of all fatal crashes in America. That's more people than have been killed by uh, terrorists in the U.S. since the 1995. Yeah. Okay. That's just one year on the road. Right. Uh, uh, and yet, the the uh, just suggesting that to take that the right of going too fast out of people's hands, uh, you wouldn't believe the the attacks and comments right. and 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 uh, hate mail that I got uh, from just suggesting that. Right. Oh well, if you want to kill automation, just do that now, and we'll never have you know kind of. Right. And I get it. I mean, people people think uh, get very impatient in, when they're driving, and yep. they want to be able to speed, even though if you look at how traffic works people speeding and cutting lanes slows everything down. <laughs> it right, doesn't it makes make no sense. So we would actually have better traffic if we could impose this regime, but it's, I don't see the political will huh. to make it happen, even though the technology, I mean, that's year? a form of primitive What year automation. are we going to have that? What year will we have that most alone? rides? No, no, most rides, the, I guess the, the way to set the betting line, as it were, is what year is the year that the majority of rides become automated. Not the majority fully of cars, automated. but fully automated. Level four, I can sleep, I can do email, there's no steering wheel, or there's a steering wheel and I don't have to touch it, I'm legally allowed to take a nap, put my headphones on, watch a movie. What year would the majority of rides be in a city, Los Angeles, San Francisco, whatever city is the most progressive, uh, but oh, a major in a city. city. Well, a major no, I think, city, because I think in the- I think it's gonna happen in Singapore in five years. Really? Yeah. Or a, or, or a, a city-state like that. Wow. Because we're, they can impose it. I mean, it's, They just say we're doing it. We're doing it. Yeah, that's it. It's, uh, I think we'll see that, and, and other countries will look at that and say, that is so cool. Because it ends, you don't have to take every trip in that automated car then. Mm -hmm. we all, even Los Angeles has mass transit systems that are quite nice. It's just the first mile, last mile problems, getting people to actually to the place where you pick it up. Yeah. Well, Metro in Los Angeles... And the city's Department of Transportation are in, in negotiation with Lyft right now to have a one fare, one card. They take you from your curb to this to the subway or to the train. Oh, really? And Here get in you Los on Angeles? The other, yes. They're going to give you a Lyft ride with your ride on the or included. That's the idea. That's what they want to do. Wow. And, and Lyft is trying to differentiate itself from Uber. Uber by being the um, supporter of public transit rather than its ah. killer. So the public transit gets to 
you drop me off where my station is. I'm 17 blocks away, so I would drive to work instead of walking the 17 blocks twice a day, which yes. I probably should do for health anyway, but I'm a mile away, so you'll just take me the last mile, literally. Or yeah, three miles or whatever, if it's yeah. too far to walk. And and that's that's a game changer because yeah. then it starts to make sense because until we get to the tipping point where it's mostly automation, there's still going to be traffic, you know. Yeah. And when they're all robots, there won't be traffic jams anymore, right? Because they can drive, uh, you know, yeah, inches away inches from bump away and, and do it twice as fast as a human can right. do it or more. But that's now that's many years in the future uh, for for, for uh, the U.S. In any case, where the car culture is so much part of our yeah. our daily life, but. If you can get on, get that easy trip to transit, and then you're on a traffic-free, high-speed yeah. train, hey, and it's reasonable. It costs less than car payments. If you mm. can, if you can line all those things up, I think it's a game changer. So uh, we hear a little bit about uh, Amazon experimenting with drones. Google now delivering burritos by drones, and then I've seen. Uh, well, they, from what I understand, they pick drones because it's a hard, they pick burritos by drones because burritos are a hard thing to ship because I guess they're heavy and they get cold quick or something. Um, they need to be delivered quickly. But um, so, and then I've seen some startups that are building what I'll call R2D2 units, which are um, ground based small boxes that roll along at very low speed along sidewalks, but know exactly where they are. Can't bump into you, or if they do bump into you, they just stop because they're going seven miles an hour. But you could literally put food in them or an iPad in them from a central location, have it go a mile, drop it off. You get a text message, come downstairs, and you just take it out of the box with your pin code. Looking at those two technologies, when do you think they'll arrive and if those will be viable and what impact would they have environmentally and then cost wise on the, on this? incredibly large transportation system we have in the United States. Yeah, I'm a little dubious of the little drone delivery really? model. Really? Why? Yeah. Why? Well, I just think um, the volume problem of having these ah. little things buzzing around uh, in neighborhoods, the privacy concerns, the safety concerns, and so far the, uh, the FAA has been unwilling to adopt rules that really allow these little drones to under 55 pounds yeah. to um, fly without being in the line of sight of their operator. That's right. the key rule. Right. And that's the safety caution they don't want to get So around. it can never really work because you'd have to have a human being flying the drone. It makes no sense. Yes. Yeah, so you don't have the labor. In fact, you're increasing your costs. You're right. You're increasing your costs. So on, uh, I think the big play f in the near term for drone aircraft is cargo aircraft. Ah. The, I mean, UPS and FedEx have been tromping at the bit to eliminate pilots on this trans oceanic cargo runs to eliminate the pilots. I mean, they're basically your pilots are do not doing any, the plane's flying itself 95% of the time anyway. So we could do that now. You think we could, Oh yeah. Or you could, you could flip a switch and do that basically. So the, the jet takes off and goes from New York to wherever, um, Spain and it just lands. And because it's over the ocean, no harm, no foul. It's not going to kill anybody. Yeah, well, and, and right now, the interesting thing is right, our aircraft, including passenger aircraft, are basically fully automated. And it's mm -hmm. only when conditions are so bad the pilots can't see that that full... So in the hardest conditions, we rely on 100% automation to take off land and everything in between. It's only... It's... <laughs> Oh, and I see what you're saying. This is the head pilot for UPS in, in Southern California telling me this. So, and so he's like, the paradoxical nature of our decision-making with planes is when conditions are horrible, we give it to the computer in the most challenging of conditions. When piloting is easy and it's clear open skies, we let humans play with the controls. <laughs> Basically, that's what it boils down to. When, uh, in fact, the computer should be doing it when it's easy as well well you'd think it would be hey maybe humans have to come in because it's a very sophisticated situation no better off to, uh, well uh, the human uh, human pilots basically function as to override uh the computer when a situation arises that it can't handle or mm -hmm. it's not working correctly uh, you know there's good reasons to have human oversight of um uh, particularly with the precious cargo of passengers on sure. board um, but right now, the capa—I mean, the capability in twenty-year-old aircraft to, to fly themselves is because the, unlike cars, which have no infrastructure that's smart, mm. basically to rely on. We've had all this instrument navigation in place for our aircraft for decades. Yeah, it's really good. Yeah, it works really well. And there's and, not that much up there. 
like in exactly. terms of you're going to run into something, there's not much up there. There's a lot of airspace. I mean, you're talking, you have the, the X, the Y and the Z axis to play with in terms of creating space. You know, they're going exactly. one, every thousand feet they go east or west, right? Like they, they, if you're going 33 or odd number, you're going east. If you're going at the even yes, numbers, you're going uh, west. Everybody knows the rules. They're very easy to follow. And unless there's a mechanical malfunction, it's pretty darn safe. And the, um, the shippers, the, the UPSs and the FedExs and everyone else are, are looking at, well, gee, if we can have aircraft that doesn't have to have chairs and oxygen and heating and all huh. and all the fuel it takes to ship that extra cost and the, the manpower, because pilots are an expensive, you know, right. uh, uh, professional. They could save a lot of money. They could save a lot of money and arguably be as safe or safer. The humans, are humans responsible for, I don't know if this came up in your research for the book, but are humans adding more to the problem now than they're solving problems in planes? I, I wouldn't say that because um, professional pilots are, are highly trained and skilled. Got you it. Know, but I f asked that question about a car, the most flawed part of a right. car we is know the human behind the wheel. Are, of the accidents are humans. Oh, even more than that. Yeah. I just the, the three main causes, yeah. uh, distraction, drinking, and right. speeding. But yeah, I mean, there's never been a recall for, for human drivers to make it. But we have, you know, uh, um, the feds are prototyping uh, devices that can be embed, sensors to embed in the steering wheels of cars that can sense blood alcohol just by gripping the wow. wheel and could shut down the car and summon an Uber. Uh, I mean, we have, we could prevent drunken driving. We, we already talked about how you could stop speeding. Yeah. And we could also uh, put the cone of silence in cars that uh, put, uh, you know, drive cell phones into voice only screen dark mode. Yeah. Uh, we could do that too. I know so with we could my eliminate. automated Model X, I have found that um, it is, I could see it lulling people. It's so good right now. I could see it lulling people into a false sense of security because it can't handle a rock or a boulder dropping from the sky. Although I hear in the 8.0, it can stop. Uh, I don't know if it can stop in time if a UFO landed in the middle of the street. But he, I, think he's, I think Elon said in the latest post that if a, if a UFO in the fog landed, it would see it through the radar, I guess. Um, but do you think that they launched that too early and that people are trusting it too much or people just are not reading the manual and reading the thousands of warnings it gives you to pay attention? I, I think it's the latter that it, it does, it functions as is designed to function. Yeah. It's just not being used as it's designed to function. And, but the thing is, I was a little surprised that Tesla released this cause I, I've been going to these driverless conferences where these guys, you know, these guys who live, breathe, and yeah, and think about this stuff all the time. And they, it's been known that humans will not be able to exercise that kind of vigilance when the car is driving itself. You're, you're ah. basically saying the car will handle all the routine stuff. You only really need to take control in an emergency. Right. Now, you know what it's like to, to maintain vigilance when you're not engaged in the activity at hand, it's, uh, it's we're not designed to do that. Right. So our vigilance goes down because we have nothing to do. Um, see, what I found very interesting about it was I found it made me less fatigued when I drove to Tahoe with it. I found I wasn't like tired when I got there after three hours sense. in the car, three and a half hours back and forth. I felt less fatigued, um, but I didn't feel like I could take my eye off the road. I felt like I had to be vigilant. But you had to think about it constantly, right? It I was... had to still think about driving, and I had to make a very objective decision that the warnings were not to be disregarded, that this was assist, not level four autonomy. Like, it's assist, not autonomy. So it, it will keep you in the lane, and it will keep the distance better than a human can. It's just so obvious. Yeah. And so you're like... This is nicer for everybody in the car because I'm not making micro adjustments to stay in the middle of the lane the whole way. And I'm not stopping and starting the braking and the gas as rough as a human does. It's doing it much more smoothly. So it felt like everybody in the car had a smoother ride. It's really interesting. Oh, I'm sure it did. Well, you know, I, one of the things I did was look yeah. at all the crashes, fatal crashes in one day that uh -huh. I could find, most of them in the you know, all over the country. And it's so... The patterns that emerge, so many fatal crashes are cars that just drift out of their lane and either into oncoming traffic or off 
the side of the road and into foliage yeah. or obstructions or whatever. It, yeah. it into happens multiple times every day. Well, many in non-fatal ones, yeah. thousands of times every day. But the fatal ones happen all the time. And it's and that technology universally, solves it. Yeah, it's universally uh, found out that they didn't fall asleep because that's like an edge case, I think, that they were looking at their phone. That they were distracted in some way. It doesn't have to be the phone. Uh, they could be doing their hair, makeup in the mirror. Yeah, even but that's existed for a long time. When the phone came out, it seemed like these instances went up. I don't know if that actually, the statistics prove that it went up when phones came out, but the phone is just too alluring for people. It is. And it's just too compelling. So technology that prevents that and also helps the car save us. Yeah. You know, most of our safety advances have been bolting things on the car that allow us to survive crashes. But now we're looking at devices that can avoid yeah. or, or overcome our errors. Yeah. What I was and that's thinking, what we need to do. That Tesla's autopilot works extremely well in stop and go traffic. And it also is good if you're like coming off a highway and you're going to, there's a red light at the bottom of the exit ramp or something and you're not paying attention or something, it goes and it starts you know, even if you're not on autopilot, it gives you that warning. Right. I was just thinking they should make an external airbag for these cars <laughs> because it's so smart huh. that if you were to run into a human who made a mistake in like the computer program you're talking about the Google campus, it would be very clever if it made a, a scoop like uh, airbag that could pop out to basically catch the person and throw them onto the hood as opposed to running them over. Like there's going to be a whole nother level of, edge cases that will address after I'm not flipping off the side of the road or going into oncoming traffic because I'm checking my phone. Like the number of ways we die in transportation is getting so finite that I think the majority of people who died in airplane crashes were killed by the pilots or a terrorist. Like it turned out there were no, um, I think it was last year or the year before I read a statistic that the number of people killed, there was nobody killed because a plane went down if it wasn't the pilot's fault. In other words, the one guy who ran the plane into the mountain in Germany who was depressed. Yeah. And then... That uh, is so rare. I mean, it's I'm, so rare now. And then the terrorists taking planes and running them into buildings like that. We've gotten to the point where air transportation is so safe that it's almost always some very big, crazy edge case. Yeah. We're going to get there with cars too. Yeah. And unfortunately, those kind of aberrations often drive policy and decisions because there's they get so much coverage and they get people so riled up. Um, yeah, we're going to lock pilots. This is the interesting thing. It's interesting you bring that up because Ed, if you lock, after 9-11, we said we have to be able to barricade the door and keep people from getting into the pilots. They got, you know what the very next thing that happens is? The depressed German pilot right. who was in therapy, and I don't know who this therapist is, but when you know there's imminent danger that somebody has depression or bipolar and they're a pilot, I mean, for God's sake, ring the make a phone call next time. Like yeah. there's a whole concept I think in, really terrible. in psychology that if you think that other people are at risk, that's when you can break client privilege. There is no more risk than a pilot who's suffering depression. I mean, depressed people can kill well, apparently themselves. Apparently the airline was aware of that. They were. Yeah. The airline was aware of it. And th this is the politically correct, crazy society we live in that somebody was like, oh, well, we don't want to hurt the guy's feelings or potentially have a lawsuit with this guy. And it's like, so you're putting him in the plane and you're going to get sued by the 220 people we kill when he goes into the mountain. So we lock the doors on planes and barricade them to protect us from terrorists getting in there. Right. And then the pilots locked in. That guy was a co-pilot. He locked the pilot out. Yeah. So the pilot couldn't get back in. It's not really defensible. On the other hand, you have an incident that is so rare. It's that not going to happen again. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, you can, and you can hardly, you can almost understand how Without the benefit of hindsight, the airline company didn't really mm. think that was a plausible scenario. Oh, he's depressed. Who doesn't get depressed? I mean, it's yeah. kind of, so I don't know. Uh, but we, you know, we shake up the world and change the way we live for very minute threats. And yet, you know, we got 38,000 people dying on either inside cars or being hit by cars every year. I mean, it's, it's like, like 13 airliners crashing a month. You know? Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> if we had 13 airliners falling from the sky, we'd do something about it. We would. That's a really interesting way to put it, Ed. If we had 13 airliners dropping from the sky, we would just... And in fact, we did have that. We did have a lot of planes 
falling from the sky and we did something about it like when terrorists were hijacking stuff or when they had well, problems uh, with as a young uh, yeah. reporter we had a mid-air collision right over los angeles basin aeromexico what? jet in 1985 i covered that as one of the first reporters on the scene 1986 i'm sorry and it was mid-air collision uh on quite a you know the entire airliner coming back from mexico uh, coming into los angeles just collided with a private plane whose <gasps> pilot had a heart attack <gasps> at the controls and drifted into con in restricted airspace. Wow. And because of the technology at that time, that aircraft's altitude was not known to the air traffic controllers. They only knew its position. Well, its position wasn't wrong. It was the altitude that was wrong. Ah. And as a result of that disaster, safety uh, anti-collision technology was put into every airliner in the world. So that cannot happen again, and into private aircraft. So the air, the airplanes, the big jets know what's around them, and they know it's exactly. Yeah, and and the aircraft will take over and, huh. and avoid collisions if necessary. Wow! So that was a case where you had a, a a real world response to a threat that could be fixed with a technological advance, and that you know actually the National Transportation Safety Board had warned. Uh, was necessary ever since there was a similar crash 20 years before. So it took a long time, but right. we finally got the result. Now we've been killing epic amounts of people on the road, well, almost since the car was, was, yeah. was invented. And we have been very resistant to making the kinds of common sense changes that would save uh, yeah. countless lives. I have a really easy solution for this. I think what they should do is they take the, le the left two lanes or left lane Left lane, instead of being HOV, becomes the automation lane. And if you have an automated vehicle, you can go in the leftmost lane and move faster than traffic. And then anybody without the automated ones can be in the right, just like they did with electric vehicles. And everybody with electric vehicles gets those little white stickers. And it's like one of the reasons you buy one is like, oh, my commute is on a, I can get into the HOV with one person. So it's like, oh, if I have automated, I can get into the HOV. I, I think repurposing carpool lanes, which Americans don't use... Uh, like half as many carpools as 20 years ago. So it's not working. Right. Uh, for a use case like that, because I'm not a big fan of mixing human drivers with no. automated, because you could see it with the Google car. The yeah. drivers bully them. It gets the only act, uh, except for one, all the accidents, uh, crashes involving a, a Google car have been uh, people speeding and rear ending it. Because yeah. the Google car is the only car on the road that obeys the speed limit. And people are like, and, you assholes. Yeah. Like, and they cut keep it off. moving. They bully it and make it stop so they could get ahead of it. It's so. Oh, really? Yeah. And it won't oh, be, so won't... you try to run into it, it stops because it fears a collision. Then you can cut it off and go around it. Exactly. I love that. Thank you for that tip, Ed. Uh, yeah. Well, now, so, everybody who's on this, if you see a Google you. car, you just pretend you're going to crash into it and but don't. If you don't separate yeah. them as you're proposing, yeah. that's going to happen all over the country and it's going to be not good. So. Hey, let me ask you about Hyperloop. I'm an investor in the Hyperloop One company. You could probably tell me more about it. Than well, that. I'm more curious on a big picture. If you think, let's just assume that it works. Let's assume that it's reasonable in terms of cost to build. I think Elon, who's not associated with Hyperloop One, except he, I think he told them he didn't mind if they built it because um, he put those plans out there publicly. So I don't think he's against it, but I don't think he's, in, he, I know he's not involved in it anyway. Um, if they can build it for a fraction of the cost of high-speed rail trains, and it can go 1,000 miles an hour, 1,500 miles an hour, and it can cross and work under oceans, what impact do you think is going to have on transportation? Well, oh, and in theory, if, if, if all those ifs uh, yeah. turn into uh, definites. And what do you uh, think of those ifs, I guess? Is it, would be, it would be... Uh revolutionary is yeah. too small a word. Um, imagine getting from, well, LA to San Francisco faster than flying. Right. And without the terrible environmental uh, and structural costs, that would be, that would be impressive. It's only 300 miles. If the thing can go 900 miles uh, an hour, it's a 20 minute ride. Uh, it's, it, it's a fantastic concept. I, I don't, I, it's hard to imagine how, how it would look with humans in it. I could certainly see it as a, as a, goods uh, shipping uh, mover Seems because like then you don't have to worry it. about the acceleration and the gravity and you know no you know, or if it crashes you don't system. really have to worry to a certain extent if you have a crash i mean who cares like and oh the, yeah we lost a bunch of iphones it's not and, the end you the know world. under the ocean that high pressure environment uh is going to be less challenging to create a uh, a system that could move goods rather than humans. that's the thinking is that they could actually connect China to the United States. So Long Beach to Shanghai or wherever, Shenzhen, and you could actually have a hyperloop that got there in the same 
maybe in three hours. So I don't know, that's 3,000 miles or something. How many miles is it? 5,000 miles to China? I don't know. 12 hours, 500 uh, miles an hour, 6,000. Maybe 6,000, five or 6,000 miles, right? Cross country is 2,500. Yeah, it's was, double that. Cargo ships, it's a 10 to 11,000 mile, but they don't take as direct no. route as we're talking about. And those here, cargo so. ships take how long to get across the ocean? That's a good question. They can do it in just a couple of days now. I yeah. Think. Why are those not electrical? Is that just, they just have a power yeah. requirement well, that's too high? Why can't yeah. they be battery powered uh, and charge up when they get to port? Yeah, too many batteries? because the, the batteries would be the cargo. And, and that's, it's very interesting because I, I, the U.S. Navy has a hybrid, uh, yeah. has a hybrid um, warship. And ah. It's called the Macon Island. And I, I, I wrote about this a while ago. It's a, it's, uh, warships use um, basically jet engines uh, for high-speed maneuvering. Wow. But that sucks fuel. So the traditional solution has been to have diesel engines for low-speed maneuvers. Well, the, the hybrid has diesel electric generators. Mm. And that doesn't sound so, you know, gee, that these burning diesel, but because um, uh, it's much more efficient to generate electricity uh, than to have the variable speeds that, uh, you know, uh, moving a, 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 any kind of vehicle uh, um, require, it's much more fuel efficient. So they can go three times as far on the same amount of fuel. Wow. Cause that ship lives most of its life going under I think it's 14 knots and that can all be handled with the electric motors, the electric. Wow. So this is the first push towards electrifying uh, a large um, ship. And it makes economic sense for the Navy because of the high cost of conventional power in its warships. Uh, the cargo vessels are now really efficient in terms of the fuel they use. Their emissions problem comes that they use this really cheap stuff called bunker fuel, which huh. is basically when you take crude oil and refine everything useful out of it. What's uh, left is they is burn? the bunker fuel. It's wow. like asphalt. You can walk on it. They literally have to heat it up to, <gasps> to burn it in their fuel system. So it's super polluting. It's terrible. It's the worst. And there's no solution. Well, they can use higher grade petroleum products. So it would- But we'd all have it, to pay a penny more for everything we uh, buy, or, or two cents or more. more. It would be a lot more expensive. And in fact, they're required to use a higher quality fuel now when they're within 200 miles of- the U.S. Oh, uh, really? So we're starting to flex a little muscle and saying, hey. Well, the whole world's going along with that. But yeah. of course, they'll just, if, if they can't come right to dock, they'll just loiter 205 miles off the coast and burn their, their nasty stuff. Yeah. I mean, there's, but it's, it's progress. It's a start. There's all kinds of experiments going on with a, a different uh, power. Um, not so much electric, but they're looking at um, a liquid, liquefied natural gas. Huh. Uh, to power cargo vessels and that'd be and cleaner that's burning much cleaner plus you we have a lot of it uh, plus you can make it and and then it becomes huh. renewable interesting how do we make liquid gas i didn't know we could do that well methane well uh, i know you know uh, you know go to your average landfill and methane yeah. is pouring out of it. that was part right. of my uh, my my garbology research but there's all sorts of ways to make biofuels that basically ah, i see what you're saying yeah serve Become the same methane, purpose yeah. yeah and nuclear reactors on ships or tiny kind of reactors i mean it seems to me that would be possible too at some point there's uh there certainly is a uh, argument being made of small scale nuclear yeah um, devices that can power things like uh, uh, putting them at ships. sea, hmm. but yeah, the, the yeah, security ocean threat. People might not be so the, interested. The and possible environmental hazard. Um, it's the public sentiment is not with that solution either. Do we ever solve security in our ports, or could somebody in China just put a tactical nuke or a dirty bomb on one of these containers and just blow the shit out of the West Coast? <laughs> the um, most cargo. Uh, let me just put it this way: most yeah. cargo is not uh, searched. Right. But um, there are uh, devices in place to detect radiation hazards mm -hmm. um, aboard cargo vessels. Aboard the cargo vessels themselves. Yes. So to get one on a cargo vessel, impossible or difficult? I'm gonna I'm gonna pun on that one. Yeah. Uh, who knows? Let's just say with the amount of uh, the amount of goods that move through the ports and the you know there are plenty of thefts and hijackings yeah. and um, th there's a large enforcement and security presence at our, our ports, but uh, nothing's airtight. Hmm. Which transportation company is going to be the largest transportation company in the world in the next 10, 20 years? Who's going to win the most? Define transportation company. Are we exactly. 
Yeah. Moving stuff. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't even think we know what that, that company is. Yet. Yeah. It may not exist in the recognizable form ah. right now. But, you know, I, I will say that. Of that the is, people who are. It's the new manu- logistics is the new manufacturing. That's where the jobs are. And, ah, uh, you know, that's the, 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 the Noel Massey, the VP at uh, UPS, said, look, Tell your kid uh, if they always want employment, uh, they should get a degree in logistics <laughs> or uh, something related to it because we can't hire them fast enough. Is Amazon going to go into that business directly? Do you think that, or I mean, they have been touching on it, I guess. They have their Well, they're already feet. partnering with everybody. Yeah. So, uh, but do you think they just at some point just take over the FedEx UPS and go directly and have their own routes and everything? Because they do it for Amazon Fresh, I guess. They do it for some same day. We get Amazon people dropping yeah. it off. You even have Amazon employees dropping stuff off on the way home for the same day. <laughs> they did that experiment. They're, you know, it seems to me that at some point they'll take that last little mile piece. Well, I would normally say with most companies, if it made economic sense for them to to do that, uh, but since they're driven more by market share necessarily mm. than their profitability, yeah. I mean, would you say that's a fair? I think they statement? have gone for market share. They want to ship more goods than Walmart and everybody else. So, so. I can't. I, I don't think it's an easy to question to predict. So yeah, they probably just want to work that's on the market share issue first, and then why why not be agnostic to the delivery? You could have UPS. They, they use everybody, I believe. They yeah, spread it out, it. right? Yeah. Yeah. All right, listen, this has been an amazing. Uh, everybody go get the book. Um, Door to Door, The Magnificent Maddening, Mysterious World of Transportation. Hey, and go check out Garbology, Our Dirty Love Affair with Trash. Uh, and thank you to our friends at Audible for keeping us really smart, reading a lot of books, listening to a lot of books. You read or you listen? What do you I prefer? Do both. I do both. But You're in the I, car I, a lot. Speaking of transportation. I, I, I try not to be in the car, but I uh, I have a uh, rescue greyhound, so I walk a lot and I like to listen rescue to rescue greyhounds. Uh, racing dogs, yeah. Wow. Rescue greyhounds. How many greyhounds do you have at the ranch? Uh, at, at the ranch. Yeah, at a given well, point in time. How many do you rescue? We just have a couple, time? but the, the thing is that they're big, but they're yeah. thin, and they also are kind of couch potatoes. When they're done racing, they like to get out for walk, long walks, but then they just want to mm. hang I'm out. a bulldog guy myself. They walk. Yeah. My, one of my bulldogs has a hard time walking from the bed downstairs uh, to breakfast. The other one, he'll walk around the yard, but you can... There, a little you, structural difference between those two. Uh, I have a feeling, yeah, one's stocky and one's thin. I just can't remember which. All right, listen, Ed, edwardhumes.com. Uh, if you want to follow him on the Twitter, Edward Humes again, H-U-M-E-S. And thank you again to our friends at Audible for supporting independent media like This Week in Startups in our quest to understand our ever-changing world just a little bit better. We'll see you all next time. Bye-bye iTunes review of the week is from Mike. Big thank you for putting out the most unbelievable content for tech startups, entrepreneurs, and founders. Leave a review on iTunes and get featured on the show. 